Ich bin froh, dass so viele Leute da sind. Das freut uns sehr, vor allem das zeigt, dass das Thema sehr wichtig ist. Wir haben auch sehr viel Widerstand gehabt, leider. Wahrscheinlich wisst ihr alle, dass letzten Monat war ich die Filmvorführung ursprünglich geplant, musste ich absagen, weil die Unileitung meinte, zu viele Sicherheitsbedenken. Aber dafür sind wir umso glücklicher, dass wir das nachholen konnten mit einem äh, neueren Film, äh, tatsächlich sogar eine öffentliche Premiere. Wie es dazu kam, würde ich auch noch mal gerne erzählen. Leider sind auf dem Campus viele unschöne äh, Sachen passiert, äh, wo unschöne Sachen verbreitet worden sind. Also unserer Meinung nach sogar russische Staatspropaganda. Und wir dachten, es ist wichtig, dass man äh, auf dem Campus so eine Art Gegenveranstaltung macht, dass man auch die andere Seite zeigt, dass man über dieses Thema redet. Äh, vor allem, dass den Studierenden vor allem, äh, Studierenden aus der Ukraine, davon haben wir sehr viele hier, dass sie auch eine Stimme haben, dass deren Perspektive gezeigt wird. Das war uns sehr wichtig. Und dann habe ich äh, Perspektive Ukraine angesprochen. Da hat sich eine Kooperation entwickelt. Die hatten diese geniale Idee mit dem Film. Die haben die FG in die Kontakt gehabt. Die FG ist auch da. Thank you for coming, FG. Es ist nicht selbstverständlich, dass er da ist. Er lebt in den USA. Und ähm, er ist zufällig diese Woche in Europa gewesen. Und ich muss an dieser Stelle ein sehr, sehr großes Dankeschön an die Jusos Frankfurt und SPD Frankfurt richten. Denn die haben letzte Woche sehr spontan äh, uns äh, die finanzielle Unterstützung gegeben, dass Evgeny herkommen kann. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you, Evgeny, for uh, coming and showing this film to your priority and uh, joining us uh, personally here. Thank you very much. This movie can be very emotional for uh, those of you who are from Ukraine. The film started screaming. I wanted to tell you some simple stories. Last year I was in Sweden and I met a professor of journalism from Frankfurt. She was there for the lecture and I was uh, doing this later with her, with the screening. And she had a child, 8 to 10 years old, <coughs> kid, simple journalist from here from Frankfurt. He watched the movie during the festival with me and the next day we had a lecture. And he was in such an auditorium like this one. And he stood at a certain point and he said, you know what? What is horrifying that you're living a few hours drive from the place where what I just witnessed happened. And you just was realizing how horrible and dangerous was happening. Literally something across your home and how close it is. So what you're witnessing today, you're witnessing the war of the this century, the hybrid war, where from one side you have missiles and bombs that are killing innocent people. From another side, you have another hybrid portion of this war, which is a propaganda that was developed many years ago. And many of you know the famous phrase that I will repeat right now and then continues to repeat it over and over. Take a life big enough to repeat it over and over and it becomes truth. And there is another famous quote. Truth is an enemy of the state. And these phrases became a part of the manual of many dictators. And that became a really huge weapon in this 21st century. So today, when we are fighting World War III, and the single John kid, after watching this movie, come to me and say, wow, I can't even imagine something like this. It's horrible. Because he saw kids like he, who not have their childhood. His childhood was taken by this war. Thank you, and we will talk after the Україна И мы проснулись в другом мире. Быстрее, быстрее, родники, накрываем, быстрее! Выйдем в окно! Не 
детей, 200 угрозанных, мирное население. Маленько. Когда уже становилось очень-очень плохо, когда бомбежки усиливались, я просто сидела и думала, как безболезненнее умереть вместе с ним. От жизни освободили, от жилья освободили, от работы освободили, от всего освободили. Ты все ее держава, ее фашист, что он заработал? Его не может весь свет зупинить. Мы всегда рады людям, гостям. А на этим гостям, которые нас пришли с мечом, мы не рады. Ребенок 19 лет, он еще ничего не видел. Он мне сказал, а кто? А кто, если не будет мужчины, будем вас защищать? Мудрость за то, как мы сейчас объединились, я очень горжусь тем, что я конец. Мы обязательно победим! Слава Украине! before even the early stages of this war started um, in 2014. In the course of this, um, I have been around a lot. Um, I've had research stays in Moscow and Kiev and in Washington, D.C. And you speak about big politics, you read treatises, you look at the number of tanks in a certain area, you speak about big politics, and I think in the Korlak office, it's very often easy to forget that war and peace very particularly affect individuals and um, affect people. Timothy Snyder once said um, the horrible thing about millions of people dying is that it's a million times one. And this is something that I was strongly reminded of when um, I saw you again, um, namely the focus on people, on ordinary people that give voice to how the war affects them and how they conduct themselves in war. And I see this in my own areas when doing video calls to Kiev. I look into the face of a person that tells me that um, this week there have been relatively few air raids and that she only has to go to the basement once. Um, and I speak to Russians in Frankfurt that are saying they are worried about speaking Russian or approaching Ukrainians because they might trigger trauma. So um, this all gives a voice and a face to it. And Yevgeny, maybe um, we can start off by you maybe describing to us how you got to the decision to focus in this movie on voices and people that are on the ground rather than um, taking all the focus on big politicians um, and big uh, treaties. It's interesting, we, before the movie, we just spoke about the common threat in Manolis. Many of you are familiar with Manolis Vinci on fire, the Korean threat for freedom. And I did about Ukraine and Maidan. Where I also gave a voice to people in Maidan. Then, on the same Maidan, I met Syrians. Syrians who being students of medical institute of Kiev who got their doctor's degree a degree in Kiev and then went back to Syria. But then because of the Arab Revolution and Arab Spring and all that happened in uh, in Syria they left. But they came to support Ukrainian people on the grounds of the Revolution of Dignity. I even met in my fourth time teachers of uh, Free Syrian Army Flag from Kuchevsko. And I remember that I met these people who were giving medical aid in the last days when the heavenly hundred was killed. And then I met them already outside of Kyiv in different places in Europe. And that led me to tell the story of the Syrian nation. Again, voices of the people. Then I did a movie with the Pope Francis, and uh, you asked me how it's different. 
you know, I try to give voices to different places in the world where Pope Francis was, where he also tried to give spotlight on the issues that this world has, from military conflicts to refugee crisis. And I guess for me, what I as an artist and as the, the somebody who tried to create in my movies, often I say, call for action, I try to focus on ordinary people. I try to create the bridges between ordinary people in these conflict zones or in these situations to the ordinary people across the globe. Specifically in this movie, I try to create a bridge between mothers like Anya with her baby to the ordinary mothers across the globe. Anya, who needs to pray every night that in the morning, she and Svetoslav will be alive to the ordinary mothers who are in this auditorium or somewhere there outside of the big world to see what does it mean for all this century. Between journalists who today in the front lines, between volunteers, doctors on the front lines that without anything saving lives to the doctors in the ordinary hospitals who have everything to save lives. So I guess my idea to give voice to voiceless, to bring this voice and amplify them through the big cinema, and in the same time to create this human connection with human bridges, that's my storytelling. That's my ability to elevate their voices to the big scene of the Hollywood, to the big cinema scene, and tell their stories and connect them to ordinary people. And that's I cherish more than just to go to the leaders or politicians. Even in the story with the Pope Francis, we barely see him. We barely, uh, my interviews with him, barely see him on the camera. I try to give voice to the people because they're the heroes in my story. And let's talk a bit more about the people. Um, I'm painfully aware um, you are two white guys talking, but I will still ask the question about women. Um, I noted in my, in my second run through this movie, um, very often in politics you have, especially in geopolitics, you have depictions of women as passive and as a price. Um, Ukraine very often has been depicted as a conventionally beautiful young woman and then you have caricatures of a Russian bear and maybe an Uncle Sam um, fighting for her. And in your movie, you give a lot of room for various female voices, and the main narrator, in my view, has been Natalia, um, who is, I understand, um, your, has been your um, counterpart on the ground within Ukraine. So maybe you can elaborate a bit more on how you selected the people um, and maybe on um, the female voices in there. I need to go for that back to my dad. When in 2014 I finished Winter on Fire, I was asked many times, will I go back and tell the story of the war that started in front of my eyes in February 2014? The real war started in February 2014. And precisely in 2021st of February 2014, if somebody don't know the date. That was the first case of annexation of Crimea. That's when the Russia Across the borders of Ukraine. And I said, no, I want other people, other filmmakers from Ukraine to tell the story. But I still was feeling. Natalia and I, we saw each other, we not became friends like right now, but we saw each other. I saw her in the grounds of Hotel Ukraine when the bodies of when the bodies of the 700 people who were brought from the street into the hotel. You can see this inside the metro flag. So I saw it there. And when I decided out of nowhere last year to go back to tell the story of Ukraine, I realized to tell the story of Ukraine, I need to fill the gap. Gap of these eight years of the war the one that is missing from the world. 
the one that the Lord neglected and closed eyes. Something that was pleasing. And that was the reason why I decided to bring people like Andre, like Natalia, who been from the ground of Maidan into the today situation. Now, another horrible situation that happens and led me to pick specifically my main character as the journalist. Last year, March, April, the biggest amount of journalists, all the journalists, filmmakers, were killed on the ground of Ukraine. The biggest amount. They were hunting us. Russians were hunting us like animals. I lost all friends. But I lost friends from your field. And it's all because we were bringing the troops out of the trenches of this war. And that was the reason. But for me specifically, I wanted to bring the story of Natalia because you probably familiar with his mom and Paul, the famous journalist who was killed in Syria. And she was a resemblance of Marvin, and that's why I specifically wanted to focus on the women, on the women as equal to the men in this book. That's why I picked specifically her as a journalist, because if you remember in my Dan movie, I had two journalists. I had Mustafa Mayem and I had um, the female. Here I decided to focus on the Natalia with the help of her to connect all eight years of this missing war. And the second character, of course, was the Anya. So for me, their female presence was really important on an on a equal level with the male, uh, male characters. Um, before I um, give it to the audience and those who want to ask a question can maybe already move to this podium where we will take the questions. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, the future. Um, my own worries about the war is, and about the, the war specifically, but also the wider conflict between Russia on the one side and Ukraine and the West on the other, is that this will take a long time until the active fighting stops, and I, I'm afraid that after that, uh, deeper bitterness will prevail. Now, we now had the NATO summit in Vilnius where several things happened. Ukraine was not offered NATO membership action plan, a NATO membership action plan. There is curious phrasing around that. It's saying it's not even necessary because Ukraine is so close to everything. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about the import of this. Um, it also said that Russia is the most direct and immediate threat to NATO security and that support for Ukraine is unwavering. I wanted to ask you what your hopes and fears are relating to the future of the conflict and what you hope and maybe observe your film um, contributing to the hopeful side of it. I think the movie itself will help to take people to the ground of the world with open eyes. And that's one thing for me. In reality, the situation, how I assess it as a filmmaker from all sides, in a minute, Ukraine will take back Crimea. Putin will be gone. Now, there is two reasons to that. Prigozhin. I was asked this question for the last few weeks, couple of times. I recently gave a huge uh, interview and it became breaking news for Latin America. I said in, a, in an interview to the main Argentinian newspaper that the Putin's regime is semi-collapsed and what we witnessed with Prigozhin is technically just the beginning, it's not the end, it is the beginning. The precaution just waiting for the right moment to take over Putin. And I think precaution at present already established the situation to blame everything on Putin. From his beginning narrative on a coup, he said it's all lies, he misled us, and so on. So he already established the beginning of the narrative. In a minute, Crimea is gone, he had the full opportunity to stop 
put him in his bag and blame everything on Putin. So for me, how I envision the whole situation, and again, from the analysis from all sides, from the reading, from the researchers, the situation is Prigozhin is not finished, he is just looking for the right moments. We need to remember that Prigozhin was in Africa and in Syria and in many other places, so he knows the tactics of Taliban, Al-Qaeda, so I am not surprised if he is sending his soldiers slowly by portions into the Moscow and will have them as a sleeping cells for the right moment because they are all on the grounds of Russia. So I will not be surprised that he will do this. I will not be surprised that he is just waiting for the right moment to attack. Some people say, yeah, he had a perfect moment when he was marching to Moscow. No, he did not. He was preparing for his march quite long. He did it and he stopped in the middle because he knew Moscow was prepared with the army but was empty with Putin and everybody whom he needed to take over. So for him to continue his march was stupid because this can cost him easily lives of his soldiers and not achieving anything because Putin, Medvedev and all others were already out of Moscow. So he did a wise thing that any other general would do. And what he is doing right now, he is establishing that trust with the government and slowly building his next step. That's in terms of precaution. But this perfect opportunity can help, can happen for him probably when Ukraine take over Crimea because that can literally be justification for him to take down Putin because he started the war and he lost everything and he led the country into the wrong direction and that will be the narrative that Prigozhin will unleash. So that's the question well. That's what I see. Now, it's maybe not Prigozhin or somebody else who oligarchs will assign over this. It can be also, but what I'm saying that Putin is weak and Prigozhin started this march towards. And when the next stage of the coup, it's a question. But it's, it will happen. So that's my uh, scenario. Now, Ukraine. Ukraine will win this war. The question, when they go into the physical offense, they are doing this step by step, because I'm talking to the people there. I think President Zelensky, who just brought all the leadership and all the military leadership of Azov Battalion from Turkey back to Kiev, I think that's for a certain reason. I think he do wants to go back and free the Mariupol and Azov Battalion, and specifically Denis, uh, who is the commander, real commander of Battalion of Azov, uh, Denis Reyes, he knows Mariupol so good and all the leadership of the Azov knows so good. So for them, it's much easier to fight over the Mariupol than anybody else, because they are knowing everything from the internal side. So I think it's just points to the idea that they are planning to go and use Azov back towards Mariupol to free Mariupol. So I think there is a lot of signs in the air kind of pointing to further steps. We just need to wait. Right. And um, lots of variables are moving. The, um, um, for those interested on the Wagner episode, um, there's a lot of data that is as of yet unclear. And there are also, unfortunately, you were outlining some scenarios that are optimistic. There are also scenarios that might cause the regime to double down on it. Um, and there has been stuff written on it, um, including by me, a, a Crimea capture is indeed something that I also think would be viewed by the Russian regime as a lethal threat. And um, if we see how it goes with the grain deal, I'm afraid there might be a risk of um, Russia using as of yet underutilized capabilities that for selfish reasons they haven't gone to um, yet. And it remains to be seen what the prospects of the, um, of the Ukrainian offensive uh, will be. I think the fact that they blow last month the dam, which literally destroyed all the uh, water supply to Crimea, 
showed that Russia wants to be cross on Crimea. And I think that points to the fact that yes, Russia was planning to defend, but right now it's 50-50 uh, because blowing this and destroying the supplies means they're really not as much looking towards Crimea and they're understanding that they're going to lose it. I, I see this situation specifically in this way. I hope you are right, because it would signify um, a less likelihood of the scenario that I outlined. But um, before we, we get into the, the details of geopolitical analysis, um, maybe we can open it up. Um, I am sure there are a lot of questions, and I'm sure all sorts of questions are welcome. Um, so if you have one, please, um, we uh, solved it such that please come forward. Um, and ask your question here. Yeah, I actually have one question. Um, I read about your uh, biography um, in the internet, and uh, I read that you're from Kazan in Russia. Do you have like relatives still there uh, whom you have contact to, or um, do you think you probably can go back to Russia? Um, but how is your your emotional and um, family relationship to Russia? Right now. I was born in Russia, but I left Russia in 1991. Last time I've been inside of Russia was the beginning of 2013, before my grandmother died. And since that, since 2015, I haven't been there. Uh, in fact, thank you. In fact, I'm in the enemy of Russia state. In 2015, Russia poisons me, like Navalny, like Kramuza, like many people on the list, on the same list. I belong to this family of uh, people who died and have been revived. Uh, it was in Toronto when they released me on fire. And uh, security services were literally after me, Russian security services were after me since my gun. And then the story to be continued because I had a lot of stuff that I had with Russian intelligence that were trying to bully me, threaten me. Uh, it was a movie done by Sputnik in Russia today about me called Al Qaeda in Hollywood as a good Jewish boy, you know. I was proud to have a Sputnik in Russia today making a movie about me calling me Al Qaeda in Hollywood. That was after Syria, when I showed what Russia doing in Syria. So in that premises, as you can see, for me it's going to be only one way ticket to Russia. I don't have any relatives uh, in Russia anymore. And I'm trying to keep myself out of the Russian soil for these reasons. But for Russian security services, it's not a matter of Russian soil. I was poisoned in Toronto, in Canada. I saw threats when I was in Argentina. I got threats, I was having threats when I was traveling in Europe, so just need to be very cautious <coughs> because unfortunately when you have a strong voice, I guess you are the enemy of the state. And uh, I realized one thing by these threats, that whatever I do with my art is the threat to the Russian. Remember what I said at the beginning of my speech before the movie. Truth is an enemy of the state, Joseph Goebbels. So it means truths that I'm bringing from the streets of Kiev or from the streets of Syria is enemy of the state. And that's why my voice as the artist, as the filmmaker, becomes so dangerous to me. So I'm not going there and I just need to be very cautious in any of those that I can do. It's, it's something that I still find hard to fathom that the Russian regime, on the one hand, is, uses the word fascist and Nazi very inflationarily, um, if one might say so. And at the same time, there are these clearly anti-Semitic tropes that are repeated again and again. I think um, it was Medvedev who alluded to Zelensky, you know, perpetrating the crimes of Nazis against his own people, which is a nod to his um, uh, Jewish heritage. So. Yes. Okay, so actually I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, you as a public person most likely give quite a lot of interviews. 
And during the interviews, whether you had any cases where some journalists or some people from the Western community were really supporting the Russian narratives and the Russian propaganda. And what is your stance on that? Whether you try really to explain and to reveal and to debunk the myths, yeah, to explain why this is Russian propaganda and to convince these people to believe otherwise, or you think that it's a dead cause basically and um, you prefer not to talk and not to address such people and you think we shouldn't even try that. That's the first question. I should I ask the second right away or should I wait? You can ask. Okay. And the second question is a bit spicy, but um, we are here to ask spicy questions. So in your movies, the characters, the, the people, the real people, they were speaking both uh, Russian and Ukrainian. And for me, as a person who was raised in the Ukrainian-speaking family, the issue of language is a very acute issue. And I think that language is well, not the primary cause, but it really deals with the Russian imperialism and something that we live through now. What is your stance there, and especially with regard to some changes in Ukrainian legislation in the film production, uh, where in terms of English, for example, taking over the Ukrainian, um, whether you thought any time of the language issue in your movies, or you just let the characters, let the heroes, speak the language they want and it's their free choice. Thank you. You know, uh, let me start with the language because it's the most sensitive question I think for you and more personal. Uh, as you can understand, I speak Russian. I can understand Ukrainian. In Vinci on Fire, I had Ruslana, who on my down in 2013, 2014, with respect to me, was speaking Russian on my interview. And I remember how I was crucified after that, how come the icon of Ukraine was speaking Russian. But it was just respect. I remember how in March last year, I interviewed Katerina, whom we saw in this movie, same character that I had in Maidan. The girl that you guys saw in Maidan speaking Russian in and I remember we were speaking Russian, and then she said, you know what, I probably for interview will be speaking Ukrainian. I said, listen, the, whatever you feel more comfortable. She said, you know, since all this war started, I started to speak for Ukrainian. But when I wanted to curse, I do this in Russian. Ukrainian is so beautiful to use bad words. But when I wanted to use something bad, I will do it in Russian. And then when we started the interview, we continued speaking Russian, but then she switched to Ukrainian. You know, I never ask people specifically speaking Ukrainian. I always ask them to speak how they do this in real life. And for me, as a filmmaker who seeking truth, it was important to show, probably for the Western world, that at the end of the day, the bullshit narrative that Russia invented, that Ukraine oppressing Russian language is a lie. Because that's my only evidence. It's evidence that the people free in Ukraine, free to speak any language, and they are, even today, during the war, freely doing this. Nobody oppressing them. It's not what lies on Russian TV say. So that's why in this movie, I allow people to speak on their own languages. Father Andre speaks Ukrainian, Natalia speaks Ukrainian, Mary speaks Ukrainian, kids speaking whatever they naturally speak with their parents. And you know, in a, a lot of places like Korean and so on, because of the closeness to the ground, to the borders of former Soviet Union, they naturally speak in this. I have a lot of friends there. By the way, my great grandmother was from Kherson. They, during the Lodomor, they moved uh, to Central Russia, where I was born. Oh, but my grand grandmother was from there. So that's why I don't try to paint different pictures, I try to paint truth. Because at the end of the day, that's the truth. Ukrainian people are free in their choices. Yes, there is a legislation, like for example, one plus one can't show this movie right now, 
on the TV because they need to either dub all Russian parts or put subtitles. Probably dubbing. That's what we're planning to do. So, yes. And I will tell you, it is the right thing because it's identity. It's not talks, yes, from the pain side right now, for Ukrainian nation, it's the language of aggressor. But I'm looking at this different way. It's identity. I had an interview on Maidan with Bogdan Tubas, who was one of the um, a commandants, we can say, of Maidan. And, but, and I remember we did this interview, it was in a Prospilog, in a building of Prospilog that was burned. And he said to me, interesting thing, it's in the movie actually, in Ninja of Fire. He said, Evgeny, you don't believe, but on Maidan, people, not only connected to their roots, every 30 minutes one hour they were singing anthem. This never happened to them before. They learned it and it became their prayer. Prayer of the nation that had found the identity. And I think the language is identity. And that's how I see it. Now, I'm happy that everything moves to Ukrainian language. I hope this country also will have second language like any others. And for in America we have at least Spanish and second language. So I hope this will happen. But I understand the pain thing. And for you personally, it's a pain. It's a pain because you know that these people who were playing the scenario of the brothers for quite a long time came and stabbed you in the back and entered your home without even permission and continued raping and killing and torturing. So I understand this point. But what I try to do in the movie is to show that the narrative of propaganda is a pure lie, and that Ukraine has freedom to everything that people want. Second, which was the first question, I was asked many times if it's a good idea to show this movie in Russia, and I said no. To try to show to somebody truth, who every other hour will be poisoned in their brain. It's stupid. They're not ready for that. They're not ready to admit. I've had situations when I had Q&A like this, and in the audience I had people who were screaming uh, that I'm giving nuts a stage. I was with Dmitro Kazatsky, who we saw in this movie, who was press officer of Azov, and who is real hero. Guy who filmed people under the Azov steam plant, who told to the world that there is civilian people, who was in Russian captivity. And he was with me in New York, and we had huge, huge problems when he was with me on the stage, because people, provocators from the audience, were screaming that we give him stage to Nazis. And you know what? It was impossible to even have a conversation, because you know what? It was like a sound of a squeezing bee that somebody was cutting. How you can try to prove somebody if there is no conversation? You can convince somebody with something when you have had a debate, like I was talking to you and each of us was expressing opinion and we can bring some kind of evidence to what each of us thinking and our uh, views on the subject matter. But when people so brainwashed, they not have the evidence. They only operating on their imagination that they can't prove. So they rather do offense because that's their way to defense. I will tell you something. We have in the United States of America so many Trump supporters, so many QAnon people. And you know what? I'm not trying to show them anything and prove them anything. Because I know it's based on my time and energy. It will come a time, and then you will have this ability to show them the truth, the question, when they will be ready. Luckily, the leftist supporters and the leftist group of the Goethe University didn't join the conversation because there are some powers in this university that love to organize fascist discussions. Listen, 
the discussions can be done when there is respect from both sides. When people only can scream because they think that that's their own power, there is no debates. When people sitting and discussing things, they discuss with them. You need to be able to listen and you need to be able to talk. But when people are not ready to listen and only want to be heard, there is no chance to discuss. No, I know this situation because the beautiful gentleman that sits on this row tried to organize what months ago the mutual fire screening. Our, our organization. <laughs> and uh, it was cancelled. And I know about this thing. So at the end of the day, if you remember, I said here at the beginning of the movie, we have a vote for three, which is a hybrid form. And one of the ways of the weapon is propaganda, it's the media. And unfortunately, it is much more dangerous than just the bullets these days. And that's what we're witnessing, that's what we have. And the drama that I had in New York, and by the way, I sent him a video, was exactly from the Marxism group. It was a girl and a boy sitting in different parts of the cinema. And later we found out that this girl was just fascinated by the Russian culture. She fascinated with Russian vodka. She was fascinated with the great sex with the Russian guys. And you know what? And my single question was, so why the fuck you do you live in the United States if such a great time you can have in Russia? Guys, if you found your heaven, so go to this heaven, go towards your heaven. If you, um, if you want to read more about the language issue, uh, Monika Wingender does wonderful research on it, um, so that would be a resource. I consider it one of the many tragedies that this um, policy of the Russian regime has inflicted, namely to weaponize the Russian language. I think there was something beautiful about Ukraine being in many ways a bilingual country. Um, but yeah, so maybe... I think we had other people in the group, mm -hmm. so maybe we, we, we take some more. Yeah, I My question kind of goes in a similar direction as well. Um, as a Ukrainian myself, I was born in the Russian speaking family, and I was switched to Ukrainian. Um, I kind of, to quote Roman Radoshin as well, uh, if you cannot kill the Russian in the front line, kill the Russian inside of yourself. Um, so I started like, consciously going back and um, looking at the propaganda you know, that was omnipresent in the Ukrainian society growing up. Um, and also you see, still kind of see it like the narratives slipping into the Western world as well. Um, and I mean, what, what do you think makes this propaganda this such effective that not only 140 million people, or at least the vast majority of it, blindly follow and blindly believe it, um, but it also slips into the Western world? And my second question is as well, um, how do you, like, for now I totally agree with you, with you it is a waste of time to you know, start a debate or open up a conversation with a person who's not ready to talk. Um, but at some point in time, when you play wins, you kind of have to counter, um, you know, 140 million people that were brainwashed centuries in the books, in the literature, in the films. What do you think would be the right strategy, you know, to kind of open up um, and counter the propaganda? You know, what? it's really interesting to think. One of the reasons why I love documentaries and why I did already two documentaries in Ukraine. I hate when people, when governments, rewriting history. Being born from the Soviet Union, I started certain history in my history books. Then when I moved to Israel, and then to the United States, I learned different history. I opened to myself a lot of interesting things. And I think one of the reasons that I wanted to document the history as of right now, because I don't want it to be overwritten. And also it's fascinating, in my phone I have pictures from some museum not far from Moscow, I think you are some, where it says that Chinggis Khan was Russian origins, and it's Russian state property took over. That Columbus was also Russian origins, and it's Russians discovered in America. That alphabet was also invented, the last alphabet was also invented by Russian priests, by Russian Orthodox uh, and so on and so on. So I can go because it's literally things in the museum. So they're effectively writing history, 
Sure, and I think the whole narrative of Putin that he is like a Peter the Great who is collecting everything that belongs helps him to brainwash these people. It's effective in Russia. Now, here in the West, I think the playbook of General Gables is still really working. Because the lies are repeated over and over, and it becomes truth. It's working. Now I will tell you the funniest story about how Russia creates propaganda. You saw it with Anya here in the movie, with Anya with the baby. I will tell you something after my dad happened to me. I was finishing Digital Fire in Kiev, it was 1st of May 2015. I was literally finishing Sauros. 1st of May, it's holidays in Russia and Ukraine, it was traditional holiday of uh, labor. And Channel 24 of Russia making breaking news that Ukraine doing a prayer for peace in front of the Mikhailovsky monastery and uh, and it's a witches and the shamans who doing the prayer. I was so curious. I'm telling you, I was curious. And I was living in front of Mikhailovsky in Kiev. I was curious to see this show. Unfortunately, I don't found anybody there. But on a TV screen of Channel 24, somebody from the studio of Channel 24 was calling to Mikhailovsky Monastery and in front of the audience, in front of the cameras, was talking to some shamans and witches who were inviting them to come and pray together. So, two surreality things that were happening in front of me, and I was there. Nobody was. So, the show was so effective, and trust me, it's believable. When somebody from the, literally, live TV, calling and we seeing people talking and that's how it's done. They, in a certain way, can sometimes jump in over the Hollywood because they invented the most fascinating shows of lies. And that's how it's done. Now, where's the violence? Where's the violence? Because there is naive people. There is naive people, and there is people who are still living in a post-Soviet kind of uh, era and history. And they believe in this. I have a lot of people in the United States who still believe that Putin is good. I will tell you something else. Anna Zaitsev, whom you just saw is the baby. Your great mother, who lives in territories, occupied territories, still believing that Putin can't put bombs on her granddaughter and her grand grandchild. She still lives in disbelief after her own granddaughter went through the literary concentration camp. And she still not believes in that. So, that's why we need to continue what we're all doing. So, spread the love, spread the truth, and I continue with my move. Well, just as a short adage to um, um, if attitudes will change in Russia, <laughs> the problem is there is a scenario in which that would happen, but that requires that things go bad for the regime in all the right ways yep. and that then it interacts. So if you look at the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you had a massive turn of popular opinion against communist structures, but it needed some years of things to, to go together, and these situations are imminently dangerous. Um, also, we know um, territorial conflicts, like the one with Ukraine, which is about ideology and who, whom does this soil belong to, they tend to um, engender rivalry and long-term conflicts between states. Um, especially if it's combined with a situation where the conflict didn't end in a clear-cut loss. So Nazi Germany, for example, was completely defeated. It was clear the ideology had failed. And there were all sorts of contributing factors that allowed Germany, after long struggles, to get past this. It's very unlikely that we will have something like this in Russia. So, please, you saw for a long time, you were very patient. I have two questions for you both. Uh, first, I wanted to ask if you said you were traveling to Moscow and Kiev and you were in, doing interviews there. Was it hard seeing that Russia attacked Ukraine even though you were there interviewing somebody? Are you asking me? You? Yes. Um, shall I just 
right away? Yes. Um, so, um, I was interviewed in January 2022 um, at an Oxford seminar with people in my field that are very important, and they asked me, will there be an invasion? And I said, all things considered, we don't know all the facts that we would need to know, but if I had to bet, then I would say no. For all sorts of reasons, it relates to rationality, we see that the Russian regime shot itself in the foot. There were good reasons to be wrong, so to speak. And now I'm writing an article on why we were wrong. There's a lot to be said more about this. I will just say, interviewing people, um, the Ukrainians were much better at fathoming the unfathomable, namely an all-out invasion. And there I discovered my own German bias, where I said, when my immediate emotional response to some of my Ukrainian counterparts was, oh, come on, this, is, this would be irrational and self-defeating for the Russian regime. And as a researcher, you have to acknowledge that and work with that. In Russia, um, I, some colleagues, when they, were, when they knew um, I wouldn't record it, they said, yeah, of course, occupying Crimea was a huge strategic mistake. But I have some theories on why it happened nonetheless. So you get good insights if you get to talk with the right people in the right way. But you had a second question to you, Um You were telling that you were making very many movies, and it was not only in Ukraine, but you did a movie about my time in 2014. And I wanted to ask you, was it, um, how did it feel to make a movie in Ukraine again, but with much worse? It was much worse than many, much more people were getting killed. How did it feel? I think that was the reason why I did this movie. Because after my dad, I thought was planning to do anything else. On, uh, on the side of Ukraine, because I wanted others to do movies on Ukraine. But over the last year, since the invasion started, I realized that I have all the tools on the ground already. I got my crew from my down there. And I realized that there is an urgency to tell the story. Why? I knew really how media operates. I knew that it's going to be hype for two or three months, and then we're heading into the summer, which will be 22, first summer that we are all freely traveling after pandemic. So I knew that Ukraine will be lost from the media space. And I also knew that I have a lot of friends that I'm losing them every day. So for me, that was the urgent reason to tell this story about people. And I still was really moved by Ukrainian resilience that I saw in my life. Uh, I was moved by the unity which multiplied through these eight years. Compare, uh, if you compare my down years and years of the uh, last year and a half, it was really multiplying unity uh, by the thousands and thousands of percent uh, inside of Ukraine. So that was the reason why I wanted to do this ceremony. And of course, another important reason I wanted to give voices to these people who every day fighting for their lives. And it was important to bring this story to the world, to make people to see through the lens of my camera, through the lens of my team, what means the war of the 21st century. It's not just the trenches of the war, like during the Second World War. During the Second World War, where the war zone, where the front lines, that's where the war. It's not somewhere in the middle of the country. Here, we have the war everywhere. So it was important to show this and educate the world and awaken the consciousness, because tomorrow, it's going to be anywhere else. So I have many reasons to tell this story. First of all, I would like to ask uh, for an applause for Evgeny and for this uh, beautiful uh, girl who made a courageous statement. Uh, and I think that, yeah, please. I think the essence of this war is, uh, as you Evgeny already mentioned, is to drive, um, to take away the Ukrainian future. And as you can see, this Ukrainian girl is a Ukrainian future. And now Putin and Russia is trying just to brutally invade Ukraine, take away this, this future. 
but my, my question actually will be related um, to the history of Ukraine. And as you as, as you shown, uh, for 100 years Ukraine suffered, and just when it will end? When I mean, for 100 years we had Volodymyr, we had Second World War, we had uh, wait, 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 we go with Volodymyr. But how about Peter the Great? Exactly. Who, who literally destroyed the entire city of Aturi, which we go in way before that, and uh, then we can start piracy. But we also need to remember that Russia always had issues with Ukraine, and the biggest issue that Ukraine was before Russia, and Russia always wanted to be the first, and this is the main issue. You know, you all saw interview with Evgeny Roizman, the name of Ukraine. And I asked Roizman, I said, why do you think this happens? Why the Russia literally started the war against Ukraine? He said, I will tell you this, but it will be in a way of the joke. It's on my interview with him, but not in the moment. He said, old drunk lady enters into the metro and started to scream, ah, you decided to be better. You wanted a better life? No. That was Roizman. He said, Russia don't want Ukraine to be free and be better than Russia. If Russians in a shit, then Ukrainians need to be in a shit. There is an academic version of that argument, but it has some merit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, then I just, just will continue, um, just maybe to, to share a personal story. I was born in Kharkiv, uh, it's in the eastern part of Ukraine, who, who doesn't know. And uh, I mean, at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, 30% uh, uh, of the building was somehow damaged uh, or destroyed. And uh, just recently, uh, we have uh, a survey that 86% of Europeans still support Ukraine. And I just want to thank you all who came today that your attention is still valuable and your support is still priceless. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, I have one question about the stance of Ukrainians about the West, uh, especially because we had the, the NATO summit in Vilnius this week. Uh, Ukraine didn't get a NATO membership action plan again after 2008, where Germany blocked it. Uh, after 2014, uh, there was no push on European integration. So how do Ukrainians feel about the European Union, about the NATO, about Germany? Um, because I have the feeling that we let you down as a country, as a, as a EU. So what you're feeling about that? What's your stance? And what the stand of people you're working with? I think it's more questions for my people on the ground and my friends in Ukraine. Because I'm American and I'm uh, literally trying to do anything and everything for my friends in Ukraine. Uh, you know, for one aspect, I'm happy that compared to the beginning of the full-scale war last year, Ukraine gave me a lot of help in terms of military. And uh, as much as people don't want to hear from me many times, and we had this conversation uh, actually, I called it multiple times in the press club of uh, World War III, and then I had a conversation with uh, General Gondages, uh, who was there, our uh, head of, uh, our former, for his former head of uh, US Army uh, Europe. He said, again, you're right. But we just can't call this World War III. I said, why not? At the end of the day, we have international supply that entry Ukraine from every country of alliance and even more. So we have international uh, kind of weapons there. Yes, we may not have officially soldiers of every uh, NATO country, but we do have volunteers from the international regions there fighting. So you technically have the old pretext and you can qualify it as a World War III because it affects the whole world. He said, yes, it's true, you're absolutely right, but you can't make people to be so scared. I said, no, I think the people need to have a cold shower 
and wake up. Because if tomorrow Zaporozhye will be blown, then Europe will be breathing the nuclear ashes and everybody will be screaming, how come we are right now at the dead end of our lives? Because we don't take care of it before. One of the reasons, and I'm going back to the question to this beautiful young lady, one of the reasons that I wanted to tell this story because my fear was that Global the Sun and Gold will again close eyes like in 2014-15. Remember, in 2015, even NH17 not was strong enough red flag to awaken people. So people were observing this as the local conflict and not as a war. And if today we again go back to this situation, what will be next? What will be next escalation? So for me, I call it this global thing because it's international and it uh, involves international community. <laughs> now, to the question about NATO. I think technically Ukraine is in NATO, but just not have a membership. Because they are supplied by the NATO, NATO supports it, but it's one of these situations like a Budapest Memorandum in 1994. It's a deal that is signed, but technically it's just a piece of paper. It's a guarantee that was given by America, UK, and some others, guarantee that if Ukraine, technically, giving up on their nuclear weapons, they guarantee the security of Ukraine. But let's go from 94, 20 years later, 2014, Crimea taken by Russians. And as the instrument to this memorandum, Budapest memorandum, we're talking, and Eunice probably knows it even better than me, they do it in Paris meeting of all foreign ministers as to force this memorandum as the security that was given to Ukraine. What did Lavrov do? He was in Paris, he even not came there. Lavrov, whose country was one of the guarantors and who is actually violating it. So this piece of paper that was signed was technically an agreement of guarantee of security. But did it give security to Ukraine? No. So I think in a technical way, Ukraine is in NATO, but the membership does not exist. I think it's a similar situation like this, this memorandum. So yes, NATO countries will support Ukraine as it is in NATO. But physical membership, I don't know when it's going to be given. What do you think about this? <laughs> now, the, the NATO summit of 2008, um, it was not just Germany, it was also France that um, was sort of on the, on the brakes on this one, as was the US government very shortly before they actually found a common position. Um, this was very short term, and then they pushed um, for proper NATO accession. The result of it was the worst of both worlds, namely, um, not a membership action plan was given, so whatever paranoia could be triggered in Russia was triggered, and it was tr triggered severely so because it included the very uncommon phrase, Ukraine will be in, uh, a member of NATO, which is unprecedented. It's usually sort of a procedural language. So Ukraine didn't have any immediate protection, but there was this long-term perspective that um, people in Moscow and in the Kremlin, partially um, for propagandistic purposes, but also because it feeds into wider um, strategic paranoia, um, was speeding things up. Um, I think the reason why people like um, former General um, Ben Hodges and myself included are, are not using the label World War um, is because the two conflicts that we have that we characterize as, as world wars um, were wars that included wars of national survival for several conflict parties. Of course, it's um, a war of national survival for Ukraine. It's not yet for Russia. It's also not yet just analytically speaking, um, for the West, and they're the most potent weapons that are out there in today's world have not yet been used. That is part of the reason why it's not called that. But there is a point to be made um, to use a label like World War III to underline the normative and political significance 
of it all and to highlight the international involvement of it all. In many ways, the Ukraine conflict um, has, there has never been a conflict that has seen so much NATO involvement than this um, Ukraine conflict. Um, but maybe because we have still a queue. Yeah, but I have questions for you right now. Right. Uh, that's the debate. Uh, you're saying that it can't be called because not all the weapons was involved. But if tomorrow the Parochia has a nuclear power plant, will be exploded. And to, for this, they don't need actually explosion that they put in next to four reactors right now. It's very simple. That that was exploded, it's a part of the cooling system. If you take in the security system of the basically power plant down and pushing the reactor to go full speed, you will create the explosion. It's, it's definitely a nuclear dimension. And, and then, and then, we are in full speed in uh, Volvo 3 because the damage and the basically the disaster that this explosion will create will be touching not only Ukraine, it will affect all the European side and it will come also to American side. But then it's definitely Volvo 3, correct? And the, the step is what? Few meters from now where we are. So I rather call it with the real name World War III, where the effect of the weapon can be used tomorrow, or we may even know, don't know that chemical weapon was used, because it was different speculations, like for example, chemical weapon was already used. So we may don't know in this chaotic situation which stuff was used. But in fact, if tomorrow nuclear is used in the way of uh, power plants, power terrorism, uh, nuclear terrorism, yes, but it will be in World War III. I very much agree that there is a high, heightened risk of nuclear escalation up until the point of actual nuclear war. Um, so um, maybe if we take the next two questions. Well, the following question, I'm starting in general terms, but then the actual question is, is, is more personal. Um, we said that the Second World War was over on the 9th of May, 1945. Um, but of course, things were not really over and it took probably at least a couple of decades before relationships between Germany and its neighbors were approaching normality. When a German chancellor could go to Poland and um, have normal relationships with, um, um, with his neighbors. Um, so my question is, out of um, the eyes of Anya, whose husband is still uh, a prisoner of war in Russia, and uh, she don't know anything about him since last summer. Sorry. And she don't know anything about him since last since summer. Since last summer. Yes. So out of um, the eyes of Anya, and also now um, personal question to you, out of your own eyes, uh, as somebody who <coughs> got poisoned. Uh, not in Russia, not on the battlefield, but actually very far in the west in Toronto uh, by uh, Russia, by Russian intelligence service. When would you say, and when do you think would Anya say, are we... The war is over? When is it over? It's a two-step. First, when the future Russian president will come to Ukraine, to Kiev, will go on his knees in front of the monument dedicated to all victims of this war, and they will ask for sorry from all Ukrainian nation. He will ask for forgiveness on his knees in front of this monument. That's step one. And step two, when Russia will start to pay preparations, that will be the full victor of this war. I, I, I agree if that were to happen, that would probably instill peaceful relations, but as, as your comparison it will already, take time. As your comparison already shows, even in the case of Germany, which in many ways is an ideal case, total defeat, ideological alternative, economic integration into the West, security guarantees from the West, 
a new enemy in the Soviet Union, all of that, and then massive societal struggles within Germany. I mean, let's remember, Willy Brandt went on his leave, knees and the conservatives called him a traitor in this country, you know? So it's very unlikely that um, the conditions will be um, as benevolent in Russia like that anytime soon. So I'm, I'm very skeptical about the... the but the question was, what is seen as the total victory? And that's the total victory. And that pans out in polls in Ukraine as well. So, okay. Yeah, just uh, step it. Uh, stepping back into the bigger big picture, seeing the uh, macro scale, how do we finish the process of decolonization of the Russian Federation, and how long will it take? It's more for you. <laughs> um, decolonizing Russia or the post-Soviet sphere, or the, specifically the Russian Federation itself. How do we finish the process of decolonization of this country, and how long will it take? I think it needs to be collapsed completely in a reborn, but for it will take quite a long time because you need the collapse of the system and you need the complete changes, but it's uh, in that case you need every republic to go its own, on its own journey into, into independence and many of them really willing to do that. And then somebody wise enough needs to restructure Russia but all the republics that were under the umbrella of the former Soviet Union need to go on their own journeys. Again, it's yeah. I'm interested in the EU also. The, the, so, I'm not saying it's the wrong term to use. Um, I'm not sure if I can analytically best make use of the term decolonization when it comes to Russia. I think what, you, what it um, associates with is, is the heritage of authoritarianism, um, of old great power status, that's always a bad thing if you have the perceived myth mythos of national greatness and then you decline. Um, because that does something to uh, the central parts of your society that makes them receptive to chauvinism and that of course is an ever more prominent source of the stability of Putin's uh, regime and there is less and less of what is usually seen as the drivers of democratization, which is a focus on a middle class that feels safe, politically integrated, and wealthy. Um, so in that regard, I would, I would again have a dire prophecy for the, let's say, mid-term uh, growth of Russia into something that we in the West might see as approaching a democracy. It's also unfortunately the case that war in all sorts of ways and through all sorts of mechanisms is really bad for um, developing a civilian culture and developing democratic institutions. So I don't have the master formula for you, but here are some factors that would have to change to get that process underway. I will say that in Russian society, although they are stifled and persecuted, there are a lot of good voices that um, long for, um, for freedom, for a break with the nasty parts of um, the Russian past, and those could be um, the seeds for uh, some form of new, actual Russian civil society. And yeah, the great example was Nitsov. Yeah. Thank you. I have already asked a question, but I always have to ask one more, but before I ask the question to me as a director, I want to comment on some statements of the moderator, who, as I heard, studies the Russian and Ukrainian military relations. As a person who studied and has background and is working in international law, I would just make several comments. First of all, please refrain from using the term Ukrainian conflict or conflict because it is not a conflict, it is war. That's very important to remember. If you want to use a proper term, you have to address it as the armed military conflict or the armed conflict, not the conflict, as you said. It's very important to do it in academic circles and in research, thanks a lot. And another, uh, another thing is to address to the director himself. Well, since your films are well, with English subtitles, right, and you show them in international arena and to the international audience. 
What would be your message, personal message, to the West, to ordinary people who live in Europe, in Germany, in France, in the US? Um, what Ukraine needs right now, and how average people need to support Ukraine? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great question. May I go first? Okay. <laughs> now we will have debate. Thanks. You asked for that. Um, I might, have, I might have dropped the term uh, Ukrainian conflict at some point, but I think I was also pretty eager to say that there's a Russia-Ukrainian war and that there's a wider conflict surrounding it. I was one of the people, especially in the German language sphere, that is repeating again and again something that German mainstream society doesn't like to hear because it's unflattering for all of them, by pointing out that in Germany for, from 2014 to early 2022, the media, the politicians, and most academics spoke about the war in Ukraine, refusing to name a war party, and that translated into policy. Since you are well versed in international law, I won't have to explain to you how the Minsk protocols um, were framed, and who was and who was not included. So, I won't take rebuke there, um, with all due respect. Um, I do agree that it's very important to focus on language there, and I didn't mean to uh, um, have the wrong um, implication there. So maybe that just as a... Yeah, thank you for the comment. It's just, you know, it's, um, it's something that I always, uh, yeah, I'm also fighting with it, and it's just, I don't know about your, like, academic works, but just using this term twice, in the academic community, in the building of the university, was a bit concerning, so I had to comment on that. Thank you. Okay, let me tell you something about what I want the West and the people outside to know. If we today <coughs> betray the Ukraine, the war can come to Poland, to here, to any other place. Because any victory will come with an appetite to take more. Unfortunately, every century have a dictator. 1812, we had Napoleon with the realistic ambition. You know how it ended. 1939, 1945, unfortunately, a painful period for this country, painful memories. But you know, we had another dictator who had a realistic ambition. You know how it ended. This entry gave us Putin, is his imperialistic condition. And Xi Jinping, communist China, Xi Jinping. Uh, he can be next, yes. He can be. This entry can bring two, but meanwhile, as an active war, we have this one. I'm talking about the people who started to take country after country. Everybody needs to understand that only standing together with Ukraine and united, we can win this war. Like we won the Second World War, and the only way, the only way we can win this war is to stand together with Ukraine. The great example when all people of different races, different social groups, different ages came to Maidan, let's watch it on fire. And they achieved their goals because they were united. So only united as one world family, together with Ukraine, we can win this war. And that's my message. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank for the film screening. I think the film sends an incredibly important message, and I wish it a great viewership. I would like, with my question, to go back to the essentials of the film, uh, because I want to get completely clear uh, on when you decided to make a film, how uh, long you've traveled, and when through Ukraine. On one hand, perhaps you could say a few sentences about the just the, the about basics. This, this one, yeah. The about basics this, about the really. genesis. Okay. And the, 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 the second part of the question I have is, when did you decide that you're done and you're finished? Because the conflict has, and this is one of the things I uh, like about the film, really walking through the whole history of the conflict again, 
uh, important event after another with Ucha, with Hip, and so on and so forth. You know, you do remember all those things that you tend to forget. When did you decide? Now it's 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 finished. Now now I can show it. Uh, uh, given that the situation changes so quickly and, and drastically uh, uh, over time, if you feel that perhaps your film might be updated when it comes out. So when after you guys saw the updated version, uh, it's uh, it's updated version. Let me start from the beginning. When the last year, the full-scale invasion started, full-scale war started, I realized that there is urgency to tell this story. For many reasons. I'm familiar with how media work here. And media is standing on a hype for one, two, three months and then disappearing. I saw it with Syria because I did a project in Syria and I saw how media was doing a peak on Syria and then it all was gone. And Syria disappeared from the media stuff. So I knew that Ukraine, that all of a sudden everyone were paying attention in the first few months, will either in April or May will disappear slowly. And specifically, it was 2022, first summer that the world will be traveling after pandemic without any restrictions. So I knew that the world will switch completely their attention from the Ukrainian situation, from the survival of these people, from the real war that was growing in front of my eyes. And I knew that I have only been to six months by the end of the summer to bring back attention. So I put it to myself a goal to tell this story in six months. Believe it or not, it's an, not possible in a traditional Hollywood sense, but all my team made it happen. The entire Winter on Fire team was working on this. We had nine editors working 24-7. Five of them were in Ukraine, two in Prague, and two in the United States. We were working across the globe. Uh, I think we locked, we started editing in June because that by this time I had most of my footage and most of the interviews. I still was conducting interviews. My last interview was done on a previous version, I will talk about two, previous version. Uh, on the 6th of August, it was Nikolaev. That was the previous version that was presented last year in Nikolaev. And 6th of August, last interview, Helen Mirren recorded for me voice over on the 26th of August. We locked cut on the 16th of August, and we delivered the movie to the Venice Film Festival, where I premiered it for the entire world on the 31st of August. Six months, and the movie was done. Now, it was really impressive because all the people in my team were inspired by the Ukrainian people. I'm talking about the American side. Ukrainians were doing something because they were determined to be. And they won. We did it in six months. We presented this in Venice, in Toronto, and so on and so on and so on. But Hollywood was silent. There, there was zero movies on Ukraine last year in Hollywood. Unfortunately, for many reasons. I don't want to go into this. And I decided at the beginning of this year, in fact, in January, February, it was first days of February, so, update the cards. And literally, on the first days of February, we started updating the cards. Last interview was on Ugledar with Natasha on the 6th of February. Ines, Ines and myself were together, what it was, 15th of February? 15th of February was the ready movie. Because we were together when he saw the first time. And, uh, uh, after that, it was premiered in Kiev on the 22nd of February. After that, it was premiered in Vatican with the Pope sitting in the audience with the refugees. And by the way, for the Pope Francis, it was the first time since 1978 when he was watching the movie. He, he, uh, Pope Francis, not watching TV, not watching anything. So for the first time, just because he wanted, he came and he was with the refugees and with the guests, and we had the royal family, we had politicians, everyone were there, and I remember how he was speechless by then. 
So that was the journey with this book. So it was already updated. Now, what is funny, which is tragic, tragically funny, uh, during the Venice Film Festival, uh, director of the Venice Film Festival, famous artistic director Alberto Barbera, he said to Natasha on uh, her interview to him, uh, Natalia came to him and said, What do you think about the movie? You invited the movie without watching this. And he said, Yes. When I heard that Evgeny said doing the movie in Ukraine, I invited him without watching the movie. And I'm proud that I did it. But I just hope that he not need to update it quite often. Back to your story with the updates. So we updated one time already, and I probably will update it again before the release sometime in the next couple of months. So I will be bringing this. Now, how you usually put in the full stop? It's a tricky question because it's the internal feeling of the director. On Maidan, it was organic full stop when Maidan finished. For me, it was easy to put full stop. Here, it's you need to find a kind of turning point in certain events. For me, Ugledar and Bakhmut in February were these kind of points that I uh, found myself. Now, if, for example, I will be adding something right now, I will be probably adding something with the counter offense and the explosion of the dam that I will be adding and bringing the rest of the Azov back home finally. So I think that will be my final points that I will be bringing into this movie in order to finish this kind of thing. Because for me, any movie is the beginning, middle and end. That's how I like to see my stories. It's the difference from the any small subject on a TV segment, on a TV where you have three minutes and sometimes you don't know the pretext what's happened before and you don't know what for sure what happened after. It's just what happened now. So for me, every movie is kind of beginning, middle and end. And here, I'm trying to find all these turning points. And I think Explosion Down is already start of ecocide and the literally terror, complete picture of the terror against even the climate, uh, Putin did. So there is a certain point that we can finish this movie. Now, I do hope that it will be something significant in the next couple of months, so I will finish this on this significant point. Now, where I was, I've been, most of my movies, I do myself interviews, except Again, except. Uh, it's not except. It's, for example, in this movie, you saw Roisman and you saw interview with the former diplomat of Russia that turned himself against Russia in Geneva last year in May. Roisman, I had my camera crew with him and I was with him on a telecommunication because I can't enter Russia. But I still did this interview. With this diplomat, he was hiding, so I did it the same way. Uh, I did a Sanico interview, but I decided not to put her, because for me, I just was sure exactly of her motivations. But again, she was in Moscow, and we did two interviews with her, two separate, at the beginning and later, and I had crew with her, I was telecommunicating with her. I did an interview with Chopin Kamatova, who was a favorite actress of Putin, and I did it in Yero, because she literally fled Russia. And I did it in person. So I love to conduct my interviews. Now, of course, I should be more here all myself because I also enjoy being there, feeling these things. It's uh, it's a personal blessing, by the way. It's uh, it's a blessing because I'm able to feel these things. It's a curse because uh, for me, I'm still living this life and I have uh, post trauma to that. But as a filmmaker, I like to feel a lot now. Important element in both movies, Winter on Fire and this one, I always need to have a big team of the filmmakers, cinematographers. Like here you have 44, I think, and in uh, Winter it was 28. Why? Because if my dad was one square during 93 days, here the invasion, full scale invasion, started from four different points. So I needed to be with my eyes on the ground everywhere. So we increase the teams to film basically the B-rolls everywhere. And as you see, it's not only in Ukraine, it was, I was on the Polish border and I filmed there. We had people in Russia also. So it's always to have ability 
to have a comprehensive story. That's why I always try to grow my teams in order to deliver to the audience across the globe all the aspects of this whole. All right. Um, I uh, think we will soon run out of time, so... Uh... Maybe I can ask a question, uh, which is... Okay, I can just ask it like that. Um, everybody is asking me, and uh, during, during uh, the... Well, they can see the movie. When, where? Okay, Hollywood, unfortunately, silent. And uh, as of right now, me and Sean Penn is trying to advocate for Ukraine. Sean's movie on uh, what was Zelensky he releasing because of him through one of the streamers on, uh, in August. I working right now with different European distributors. We will be starting to probably aid the from end of August or September, I think September, with different TV channels across the year. And later, in the fall, probably it will be available everywhere, from iTunes to Amazon to uh, Google Play to Vimeo Demand. But as of right now, we're discussing to give a prime window between theaters to TV channels in Europe and then go back to America. So it means just fall. You can go to Freedom on Fire, that film, and you will follow all the news. That's the website, freedomonfire.in. And you can follow all news, but it's in the next, literally, few months we will be releasing this, because I and Sean committed to promote both of the movies. Thank you. And I guess the last sentence that I want to say, that everybody in this auditorium, can contribute to this peace and to help Ukraine to be. Because on Maidan, it was a poster, is the big drop of water. And under this drop of water, it says, each of us is a drop of water. Together, we are in ocean. So together, we can bring the change. Together, we can spread the troops. Together, we can continue to help Ukraine to fight on the media space and be visible. So continue doing what you guys do. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say a few last words. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for staying till the end. I know it's very hard. Uh, I just want to say, um, like the semester ends this week, but we plan uh, a lot of events for the next semester, like from October. So you should stay tuned, uh, follow us on Instagram, Perspektive Ukraine, Yuzo Haski. We will definitely organize one or two another event where we're going to talk about other issues related to uh, the war against Ukraine. Uh, I hope I said it correctly. Um, and yeah, in, sep in September, according to what I know, I was already invited to be here back in Frankfurt because on September there is a screening in the Bundestag and there is another screening in Berlin in Sweden, Swedish Embassy because they, because of their NATO membership, they asked me to screen this movie actually. I was asked by the embassy, it's in Berlin, and I do know that I have like two days event here in Frankfurt. In September, something around between 19th and 20th, 21. So we meet again. Yeah.